We know in Genesis 1 and verse 1 uh, uh, that it talks about the recreation of, uh, of God's creation, our Father's creation. And from the time of the recreation uh, to the first coming, uh, to, to Je Jesus coming and living as a human being on this earth, covers approximately 4,000 years. <clears throat> and for much of those 4,000 years, uh, that history recorded in the Bible, only the highlights are given. Um, and in fact, Genesis uh, chapters 1 through 5 cover the first 1,650 years and five, you know, five chapters, uh, beginning with Adam and Eve and, and ending with Noah being 500 years old. And uh, you can get that, that approximate total of 1,650 by counting of the uh, genealogies in chapter 5. Uh, the first five chapters cover roughly 35% um, of human history in five chapters. Now, that's the talk about a Reader's Digest version, that, that's it. Uh, and it's done, the first five chapters are uh, accomplished that by recording, obviously, only the high points. But then... After the first five chapters, something extraordinary happened. The next four chapters are dedicated to one event. 1,650 years in five chapters, and then four chapters in one event. Uh, and it's described comparatively in minute detail. That one event uh, is the biggest single disaster in human history. So by way of introduction, uh, let's look at that event. Let's go to Genesis chapter 6, and uh, we're going to read verses 13 through 15, and then 17 through 19, and then verse 22. Uh, you might want to place a marker here, and as usual, um, unless otherwise noted, I'll uh, be reading from the King James. We're going to read Genesis 6, 13 through 15. 17 through 19, and then verse 22. <clears throat> Genesis 6 and verse 13, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Yehovah tells righteous Noah. Verse 14, Make you an ark. Now notice he gives the details. Make you an ark of gopher wood. So he tells Noah what to make it of. Then he tells him how to make it. Rooms shall you make in the ark, and then you shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And the Hebrew word for pitch means asphalt, a sealant. And I'm certain God gave Noah very detailed plans for the ark. Had to have done so. How to lay the keel, how to shape the wood, the, the uh, angles of the wood, and, and uh, the formers uh, that attach to the keel, and all of that. All the proper dimensions he gave, to, he gave to Noah. Verse 15, And this is the fashion which you shall make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, and the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. Okay, well, how long is a cubit? Well, it's, it's impossible to say for a certainty, because you have uh, the long and the short Hebrew cubit, you have the Babylonian cubit, and then you have the long and the short Egyptian cubit. Uh, and all vary between uh, 17 and a half inches and 20 and a half inches. So uh, just for discussion's sake, we'll take the uh, middle of that at 19 inches and call a cubit 19 inches. So if that's the case, if we pick that number, the arc was approximately uh, 450 feet long and 80 feet wide which means it's about one and a half times the length of a football field and about half as wide as a football field. 
no small boat. Big undertaking for four men, when you think about that. Verse 17, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with you will I establish my covenant, Yehovah says to Noah, and you shall come into the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shall you bring into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Verse 22. Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Very submissive, very obedient. I'm sure he was very detail-oriented, and he followed Yehovah's instructions to the minutest of details. So if Yehovah divinely inspired almost as much attention on this one event as he did the prior 1,650 years, then there have to be lessons for us to learn from this one event, since it takes up so much space in God's Word. And uh, there have to be lessons for us to learn, because there are great parallels, as we're going to find out, between Noah's day and Noah's world and our world today. So the title of the sermon, if you, if, if you want to note that, is Lessons from the Life of Noah. We'll look at that through four points, but we're going to do two things. First, before we get into those four points, we're going to look at the account of Noah and the ark and then get into the four lessons we can learn from this cataclysmic event that... that uh, occurred to Noah and the world. So let's look at the account of Noah and the ark and, and just become, re-familiarize ourselves with it, because I know we're all uh, basically familiar with the general story. But first what we want to do is get some facts about ocean waves and currents and uh, shipwrecks to give us an idea of what Noah and his family were going to go through. Um, the largest wave that has ever been recorded since they began recording those things, uh, the largest wave ever recorded in any ocean since the keeping of those records is roughly 100 feet high. That's uh, as high as a 10-story building. Think about a wave that high. Uh, the Smithsonian Institute on their website says, quote, an earthquake followed by a landslide in 1958 in Alaska's Latuya Bay generated a wave 100 feet high, the tallest tsunami ever documented. When the wave ran ashore, it snapped trees 700, 1,700 feet up slope. So well over a quarter mile up slope, it was snapping trees in half. Now, uh, that That is a, a tsunami wave. Now let's look at the sinking of a ship, one I'm very familiar with. I've, I've kind of followed it and read histories about it. It is the ore carrier, the Edmund Fitzgerald. And that, of course, that event was memorialized in song by Gordon Lightfoot back in the 1970s, the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. And um, I, I the reason I have an affinity for that as I was stationed in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, which is at the east end of Lake Superior, which was uh, the uh, lakes, the Sault Ste. Marie locks are there to get you into the next lake. You have to drop down. And the the uh, mighty Fitz, the Edmund Fitzgerald, was heading to the Sault Ste. Marie locks when the wreck occurred. And um, the mighty Fitz, as it was called, was launched in 1958, and it was 729 feet long. And its beam, its width was 75 feet. 
and its gross tonnage was over 13,600 uh, gross tons. So it was the same width as the Ark, roughly, but much longer than the Ark. Um, it was the largest ship on the Great Lakes since uh, until 1971. And the Edmund Fitzgerald was powered by a 7,000 horsepower uh, steam turbine. And uh, for years, it held the record load of iron ore at 27,400 tons of iron ore in one sailing. Think about that. So on November 9th, 1975, uh, the, the Edmund Fitzgerald left Superior, Wisconsin. That's near uh, Duluth, Minnesota, at the west end of Lake Superior. And it was heading east to the locks at the east end of Lake Superior in Sault Ste. Marie. And uh, I've, I've toured the locks, been to the locks, watched the boats come and go when, when I was in the Air Force. And for a guy coming from the desert of West Texas, it was kind of a revelation to see all this occur. Um, but after, as they were loading up, uh, the, we the weather started changing. And uh, by the time they were ready to sail, a full-blown November gale had developed. And the winds that day, before that day was over, the winds were at 85 miles an hour. And the waves were 55 feet. Uh, that's five stories. And so he uh, decided to sail on the northern uh, shore of Lake Superior, the Canadian shore in the Lee the lee side of the wind, since the wind was coming from the north, from the northwest, uh, to get some shelter from that storm. And uh, they sank the next evening with the loss of all 29 crew members on board. And uh, after years, they finally found it and, and went down and explored it. And uh, the wreckage revealed that the boat was broken in two. It was broken in half. Now, there are very th various theories as to how that happened, but the fact is that the weather and the winds and the waves were so great that whatever the cause, it, it eventually broke in half. And this is a boat made of metal, uh, not wood. And um, a, uh, a more recent uh, wreckage uh, uh, occurred uh, in the Atlantic uh, on October the 5th of 2015, a 790-foot cargo carrier, El Faro, went down uh, during a hurricane, Hurricane Joaquin, that was just a Category 4, but it had wind speeds of 155 miles an hour, and that boat could not survive those winds and those waves. Now, the ark commanded, uh, the, the ark God commanded Noah to build was roughly 75% of the length of these two ships and about as wide. And it was made of not metal, it was made of wood. And, uh, and these metal ships uh, sank in normal earthly weather. Now, when you think about our father, Yehovah, bringing something special, uh, in that regard, we can, I think, all understand that the uh, the waves and the weather would be much greater than a hurricane in the Atlantic or a storm on Lake Superior. Now let's look at the wind and weather Noah might have encountered. Let's go to Genesis 7 now, and we'll read verses 11 and 12, and then 17 through 24. Genesis 7, 11 and 12, and 17 through 24. In the 600th year of Noah's life, Genesis 7, verse 11, um, in, this, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open. Now, this is something more than just a, a, a hurricane uh, or a tsunami or something like that. This is a world-shattering 
literally a world-shattering, earth-shattering event. Let me read from the website, the Institution for Creation Research, uh, about this. Uh, quote, as the deep in Scripture usually refers to the ocean, so the great deep, which was broken up, evidently speaks of great subterranean chambers deep inside the earth, all of which spewed forth their contents at the same time. The reference to broken up merits attention, for it implies a wrenching of the earth's crust, a great tectonic event. And you can see that God Almighty just tore the earth's crust to, to have these fountains of the deep come up. And then, of course, the tremendous rain from the, from the sky. The same word is used in Numbers 16 to describe the supernatural opening up of the great pit into which the rebellious Korah and his followers and their families fell through a, a tearing of the earth's crust. Any such breaching of the earth's crust results in earthquakes, and if occurring underwater results in devastating tsunamis traveling through the water at speeds approaching the speed of sound. Now, when you think about that, and uh, think about water coming from the sky, and then water coming from, from tears in the crust of the earth, uh, can you imagine the horror that people faced when this event started? Verse uh, 12, And the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights, Verse 17, and the flood was 40 days upon the earth, and the waters increased and bore up the ark, and it was lifted up above the earth, and the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. And the ark went up upon the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. The entire earth was covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. So whatever the highest point on earth was at that time, and my guess is that at that time they didn't have the mountains that we have today, but that's just a speculation. But regardless, the waters covered the earth, the highest point on earth, uh, by, by over 24 feet. So everything was covered. Verse 21, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle and of beast and of every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth and every man. And all, uh, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life and all that was on dry land died. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle and the creeping things and the fowls of heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth, and Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth a hundred and fifty days. <clears throat> now, there's no mention here of sea creatures. And uh, that's interesting because uh, we could we could speculate that the nothing changed with the sea creatures, uh, but the Bible doesn't say. Now let's go to uh, Genesis chapter eight and verse two. The fountains also of the deep, and the windows of the heaven, were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. So it appears here that not only it rained for 40 days and 40 nights, but also the underground aquifers and gigantic uh, lakes of water underground, uh, the fountains of the deep ruptured for 40 days. The rupturing occurred for 40 days, the rain occurred for 40 days. And it could be because the, the earth's uh, crust was breaking up with the resulting uh, 
tsunamis and the wave action because the crust is is tearing open and, and heaving upward that the earth's uh, crust was totally restructured afterwards and it was uh and it could be that during that event the uh, you know mountains if there were tall mountains they came down some we just don't know or it was po it could be possible that there were no great mountains before the flood uh the weight of the waters pressing on the earth during the flood could have forced up parts of the crust to form mountains. Someday we'll, we'll find out about that. Uh, it could have forced up Mount Ararat, uh, where the ark settled. Uh, Mount Ararat is uh, 3,000 feet taller than Mount Rainier. It's uh, 17,750 feet, so it's, it's no small uh, mountain. But most certainly, this was the most violent storm in, in all of history. So if rain and wind and tides today can produce 100-foot waves that sink metal ships uh, much larger than Noah's Ark, how big were the waves that occurred during the flood? Uh, were they twice as big, say 200 feet? Maybe they were a thousand feet, quarter of a mile high. We just we just don't know. I mean, a thousand feet is a, is the equivalent of a hundred story building. The Empire State Building is hundred and two stories. So there could have well have been waves as tall as the Empire State Building. And all this went on for nearly six weeks, not just for a day or two, but this cataclysmic event went on for nearly six weeks. So the earth was totally shaken and all human life perished. And we, you know, it's interesting to speculate on, on, the, on, on how many people died during Noah's flood. And I, and I did some research and there are various institutes that track human population since they as far back as they can go. And uh, I looked at a number of websites and the low estimate uh, during Noah's day was 750 million world population. Uh, 750 million in population in the world. Of course, we have billions today, but that was the low estimate. The high estimate was over 10 billion, which is higher than the population of the earth today. So if we take the average, say, of 4 billion, that's roughly half of the world's population today. And, out, and without doubt, this was the biggest catastrophe in the history of mankind. So God Almighty devotes four chapters to this catastrophe. So there must be some powerful, powerful lessons that the Father wants us to learn from this, relatively speaking, detailed account of this tremendous event. So we're going to spend the rest of the time looking at uh, four lessons from the example of Noah that apply to us today because, as we know, we live in the days of Noah, very similar to the days of Noah. And uh, this uh, can help us going forward and looking at world events. So point number one, the first lesson we can learn is Yehovah gave Noah a part to play in his own salvation. Yehovah gave Noah a part to play in his own salvation. He just didn't sit around and, and uh, put his feet up in the recliner and wait for salvation to occur. He had a part to play in it. And uh, as we have seen, the father gave Noah special instructions on how exactly he wanted this boat built, which seems to be strange at first glance. Uh, he gave instructions on how to build this boat, but if no boat could uh, would be strong enough to endure the winds and the waves of the Noatian flood, there's no boat humanly can, that can be built. 
that could withstand that, uh, and especially just out of wood, um, the fact is, it's, it's uh, interesting that the father would go into such detail. And, uh, and this is especially true if, if Yehovah was going to save Noah miraculously, why didn't he say, well, hey, just build whatever you want and I'll take care of the rest. You know, just provide a boat big enough for you and your family and I'll take care of the uh, animals and I'll take care of other things and and uh, you just uh, build any old boat you want. Uh, but the Most High didn't do it that way. He told Noah exactly what to do and how to do it. And so he gave him, he gave, Yehovah gave Noah a part to play in his own salvation. And with the instructions on how to build a boat, and then our father just patiently waited to see what Noah would do with the instructions. And uh, as we see, with in the, you look at the narrative, it's obvious Noah uh, was very conscientious, he was very detailed-oriented, and he did exactly what his father told him to do. So what's the lesson for us? Well, we too have a part to play in our own salvation, just as Noah did in his. Uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 19, and uh, we're going to read verses 16 and 17. And uh, a man is coming to Jesus and asking him a question. Very familiar part of Scripture, Matthew 19, verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, to Jesus, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if you will enter life, keep the commandments. And he goes on to, to uh, enumerate those commandments. But the fact is, Jesus said, Oh, just give your heart to the Lord and that's all you have to do. No. He says, I have commandments that I'm giving you, and I'm redefining in some cases from physical to spiritual, and I want you to obey the commandments I give you. That's your job. That's the part you have to play. Let's go to Ephesians 4, and we'll read verses 22 through 24. Uh, Paul writes uh, here in Ephesians 4 and uh, verse 22. Ephesians 4, 22, Paul writing, this is our part to play. That you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Verse 23 of Ephesians 4, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and true holiness. So part of, of the part we have to play is to change from the old self to a new self, to a new person, a new creature. And what is that? Well, we're told over in Ephesians 2 and verse 5. Uh, we'll read uh, uh, verse 5 and then uh, also verse 12. Uh, I'm sorry, Philippians 2 and verse 5 and Philippians 2 and verse 12. Again, Paul is writing here, Philippians 2 and verse 5. Paul says, this is where he's telling us, okay, you have to convert from one person to a new person, and here's the new person I want you to convert to, that the, our Father wants you to convert to. Philippians 2 and verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, the same mind he had when he walked this earth. Follow in his footsteps. Obey him. Follow his example. 
verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We have a part to play to work out our own salvation by making the change from the carnal human being to a human being that is in the image of the very Son of God. So as with Noah, Yehovah gives us a specific part to play. He commands us to build not a physical ark, but our own spiritual ark in that sense. According to the instructions, he gave Noah a physical set of instructions. He gives us a spiritual set of instructions. And he said, I want you to reform yourself, not build a boat this time, but reform yourself into the image of my son. And so Noah, we see, was perfectly obedient as far as we're told. Not once did he disobey, and he followed in every detail, and we must be as obedient as Noah. Okay, the second lesson we can learn <clears throat> is that Noah was motivated by what he could not see. What motivated Noah was something he could not see. In other words, he was, he was not motivated by uh, what was visible with his two eyes. He was motivated by something totally different. Now, we don't know how long Noah worked on the ark, but the Bible gives us a hint of how long he might have taken to build the ark. Let's go back to Genesis 6. Uh, Genesis 5, I'm sorry. Genesis 5, and we'll read just verse 32 to kind of uh, uh, discover how long it might have taken him to build the ark, him and his boys. Genesis 5 and verse 32, And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Okay, so there's a benchmark here that uh, around 500 years of age, he begat his three sons. Now, the next chapter, Genesis 6, we'll read verses 10 through 14. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, notice the very next verse, verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So this, <clears throat> in, in, a, in a time sequence, uh, happens, you know, it got really bad after the birth of Noah's three sons. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way, Yehovah's way, upon the earth. Now, verse 13 we read earlier, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And then in verse 14, the simple command, Make you an ark. And then he was given undoubtedly detailed instructions on how to do so. Uh, Genesis chapter 7 now in verse 6, And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters was upon the earth. So we have a hundred year uh, period of time here that within that hundred year period of time, uh, Noah had, had 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 his three sons and Yehovah talked to him, gave him building instructions. He began to build. And uh, at the end of the hundred years, the flood came. So maybe it was 50 years, maybe it was 75 years, but it was... Uh, probably no more than a hundred years from being told by God to make the ark until actually walking in the ark and having God Almighty close the door behind him. Now, let's ask the question. If we Let's just pick a hundred years, just to pick a nice round number. It took him a hundred years, four men, a hundred years to build this ark. And the question is, how many days during those hundred years 
was Noah building under clear, cloudless skies? Think about that. Uh, and how many years uh, did he experience droughts while building of those hundred years? Well, it may have been most of them or a half of them. And, uh, and you can see people drifting by and looking at this big boat. Let's say you're uh, driving from east to west across central Washington in the high desert and you're, you, you get off Interstate uh, 90 and you see this boat out in the middle of a dry field and you go over and ask this guy what's going on and uh, he says, I'm building a boat. And, uh, and the people say, well, the, the rivers are drying up, the, the lakes are drying up and you're building a boat? We haven't had rain in two weeks and you're building a boat? The nearest body of water is X number of miles and you're building a boat? You can, you can see what would transpire. Uh, and as long as he took to build it, Noah was motivated by things he could not see. Because a good bit of the time, clear skies, no rain, uh, no marshes, no, you know, lakes building up around the boat to indicate there might be something coming. And he never stopped. He was not motivated by the blue skies that he could see. He was motivated by Yehovah's promise that a flood is coming and you better get to work. Now, the same should be true for us today. If we base our spiritual sense of urgency, in other words, how hard we work on building our spiritual ark, on what we see in the world, we could likely, we could likely give up. Or we could say, yes, the world is getting worse, but hey, it's not as bad as now as it was in the time of Noah, where everything was violent. Everything was perverted. There's still some good spots occasionally, increasingly less so. But we could say, ah, yeah, we got time. We got some time. Let's go to 2 Peter 3, and we're going to read verses 3 and 4 under the second point. 2 Peter 3 and verses 3 and 4. Again, reading out of the new, out of the King James Version. 2 Peter 3, verses 3 and 4. The Apostle Peter says in 2 Peter 3 and verse 3, <clears throat> Knowing this first, <clears throat> that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, scoffers that God exists, scoffers that the Bible is his word, and yet doing what they want to do, following their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Yeah, all you Christians, all you talk about, all I see in the when I twirl the channels on a Sunday morning as people talking about Christ returning, but I don't see that happening. I don't see any, any evidence of that happening. <clears throat> Scoffers. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the be beginning of creation. Nothing's changed. Everything's about the same. It's called the doctrine of uniformitarianism. It's a, it's a big, long word, uniformitarianism. And what that doctrine basically says is what was yesterday will be tomorrow. Nothing basically changes. And the reason they will be scoffing is that they are walking by looking at cloudless skies. They're looking at dry land and uh, they are not considering what might come. Now, let's go to Matthew 24, and we're going to read verses 37 through 39. 
Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39. I'm going to read this out of the New King James. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 37. And Jesus here confirms the account of Noah. Jesus believed that the Noatian flood occurred. Maybe we should too. Verse 37, Matthew 24. But as the days of Noah were, Jesus said, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. And did not know, they did not know, until the flood came and took them all away. They didn't know it. They were surprised. They were trapped. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And so to the physical eye, the non-spiritual eye, the non-discerning eye, things are going to be kind of normal in the last days. Uh, of course, until the dark clouds come, until the earth begins to rumble, and then in a very short period of time, everything changes. So we are to walk by something different than physical sight. We won't turn there, but the 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 6 tells us very plainly, we walk by faith, not by sight. And that's the lesson for us today. We have to walk by what we don't see, but have faith in. And Noah's motivation was based on faith. His sense of urgency was based uh, not on what he could see, the blue skies, the cloudless skies. He was not looking at the blue skies. He was looking at his father's promises. And we should learn from Noah's example. We're not to base how hard we work spiritually on what we physically see. Because if we do, we'll get trapped into slacking off. We'll get trapped into thinking, well, we got more time, or it's not going to occur in my lifetime. We can make all kinds of reasonings and excuses. But rather, we should work hard because of faith in our Father's promises that He and His Son will return when least expected. And that we always have to keep in mind. Now that leads us to the third point, <clears throat> and a big one for us today. Noah did not let society discourage him or cause him to give up. He didn't let the society around him discourage him or cause him to give up. In Noah's day, nearly every person, we're told, was evil. And we're not there yet, but we're getting closer. In his day, nearly every, and it's hard to believe, you know, er, nearly every person, it got so bad, every person was evil. Let's go to Genesis 6. And we're going to read verses 5 and then 11 through 12. Genesis 6, verses 5, and then 11 through 12. Genesis 6 and verse 5. And Yehovah saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And we're, we're getting close, but we're not there yet and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Totally rejected God Almighty. Totally carnal. Totally lustful. Verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God. Even the, everything on the earth was corrupt. And the earth was filled with violence. And we're getting there very fast, the filled with violence part. You see what's going on in our cities and the mass shootings and then 
tribal warfare and clan warfare and nation going against nation all over the earth. And the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted His way, Almighty's way on the earth. So we see here every motive, every thought was evil continually. And the earth was corrupt, and the earth was filled with violence. And we can see that, yes, we are approaching that. Now, we are not totally full yet, but we are approaching that. But did this evil society that surrounded Noah cause him to compromise in any way, slack off in any way? Did he let it wear him down? Well, the Bible doesn't indicate that that is the case at all. Notice what happened during that 100-year period of time uh, during the construction of the boat. Let's go to 2 uh, Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. What did Noah do while he was building the boat? And what was, his, what was he doing and what was the motivation behind what he was doing uh, in addition to building the boat and pleasing his father? 2 Peter 2 and verse 5. Now we see here, not only we saw earlier Christ confirmed the account of Noah, we see here Peter confirms the account of Noah. 2 Peter 2, verse 5, And Yehovah spared not the old world, Peter said, but saved Noah, the eighth person, notice this, a preacher of righteousness. Why would he say that? He says, not only the preacher of righteousness, but the eighth one. So there must be a lineage, there must be a plan over the centuries to preach righteousness. The eighth preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. The Greek word for preacher is Strong's 2783, and it means a herald. A herald is an announcer. A herald that is of divine truth, Strong says. So he was announcing divine truth to those who came by and watched him build this ark and were stupefied seeing this boat coming out of nothing out in the middle of a field somewhere probably. Now, this word uh, preacher is used only three times in the New Testament. Uh, the other two times were used by Paul saying that he was a preacher and an apostle. And the inference, inference in using this word uh, is that Noah was not hiding. He wasn't building the ark in secret. He wasn't building it, you know, up in the mountains in some remote valley somewhere. He was building the ark in plain sight. Otherwise, how could he uh, uh, not be a preacher of righteousness? So he uh, built it in an area where there, there must have been uh, uh, roads and cross roads and maybe at an intersection of, of uh, popular travel routes where people could see what was going on and then he would have a chance to preach righteousness to them. In other words, he was building the ark in plain sight. No, no hidden agenda here. Now let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 18 through 20. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. First Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Peter, uh, again writing, says, For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, Jesus living a perfect life and dying for us, who we certainly haven't lived a perfect life, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Verse 19, I'll read out of the New Living Translation. So he went and preached 
to the spirits in prison. Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison. Well, who were these spirits in prison? Well, the Greek word for spirit uh, is pneuma, and it 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 just means a you know a life. But to find out who these spirits in prison were, all we have to do is look at the context, who they were. Verse twenty tells us. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. So he preached to the spirits in prison, meaning they were prisoned, in prison to Satan, in prison to the world, in prison to the violence, in prison to the evil. And they would come by and watch this boat being built, and Noah would warn them what was to come, and why it was coming. Going on, only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. So we see here these spirits in prison were pre-flood humans to whom Jesus used Noah to preach the truth and to set an example. Clark's commentary says this, quote, Christ preached to the ungodly world by the ministry of Noah. Jameson Fawcett and Brown's commentary says, quote, So before his incarnation, he preached in spirit, referring to Christ, before his incarnation, he preached in spirit through Noah to the antediluvians, meaning those who lived before the flood. And so we see here that Noah preached upwards of 100 years. And uh, how many people can you talk to in a 100-year period of time? Uh, a goodly number. Let's go to Hebrews 11, verse 7, and uh, uh, get some more details uh, about Noah not being discouraged, but by being obedient to God, Hebrews 11, verse 7. Now we see here that Christ confirmed the account of Noah, uh, Peter confirmed the account of Noah, and we see here that Paul confirms the account of Noah. Hebrews 11, verse 7, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, uh, Jameson Fawcett and Brown said that it says that the word fear here means reverential fear. Wasn't he wasn't uh, uh, you know just seeking the, the his own uh, saving of his own life, but he had reverence toward God Almighty, wanting to please Him and wanting to obey Him. Noah, being warned by God of things not seen, moved with fear prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world. And the Greek word for contem condemned is Strong's 3632, and it means to judge against or to sentence or to condemn. So he was preaching and, and he was condemning them for their behavior, their thoughts, their actions, their violence. Uh, and he was saying, you're going to pay the consequences, uh, and the world uh, is going to be uh, encircled with a flood, and uh, that's why I'm building this boat. And of course, they would scoff, and they would laugh. No, he was publicly proclaiming to the world around him what was going to happen. And he was telling them to repent. Look, before it's too late, repent. And of course, he met was met with ridicule and scorn and laughter. And uh, if we put that in a modern day context, as I said, if he was building the boat halfway between Seattle and, and uh, Spokane, right off the freeway, uh, out in a dry field on the interstate, off the interstate, People would say, hey, old man, what are you building? He said, well, I'm building a boat. Well, okay, but where's the water? And that old man would say, it's going to come. 
And let me tell you why. It will come. And of course, today, if that happened today, the, the TV reporters would be out there, the newspapers, the magazines, the internet folks would be out there and uh, it would be all over the internet. <clears throat> uh, but today, obviously, they didn't have those forms of, of uh, communication. And I believe that's one of the reasons why God Almighty took 100 years to, uh, to have this happen. Because, because of the fact they didn't have the communications that we had today. That's why God allowed 100 years for this account to circulate around the earth. Because 100 years is a long time. And uh, depending on where he was located, and as I said, he wasn't up in some, some remote mountain canyon somewhere. He was probably at the crossroads of, of uh, uh, two major uh, uh, we would say today, highways. Uh, and people were traveling back and forth and to and fro. And the story of this boat would be a common thing that was passed on from people going in different directions. And over a hundred years, uh, it seems very likely that most of the world knew that there's this crazy man out in the desert building this boat and he's saying the world is going to be flooded uh, and, and we're all going to die. And he's building this stupid boat. And uh, this, this preacher of, this, you know, wacko preacher of righteousness. And this went on for a hundred years. And it took that long for that, the story to circle the earth. Now put yourself in Noah's position. Can you imagine Noah for a hundred years putting up with constant ridicule? Every day there's a new group of people passing down this highway or this roadway, and there's new ridicule. I mean, he's heard it all before, but it happens over and over and over every day for a hundred years, except maybe on the Sabbath where the boat would just be there and they'd go off somewhere and get, uh, get a Sabbath's rest from this ridicule. But can you imagine putting up with that for that long? Okay, well, what about us today? What about Noah's uh, following Noah's example for us today? We know that one of Satan's greatest, biggest tactics uh, is to allow the evil society around us to wear us down. It's almost like erosion. Uh, a dripping water, dripping water can wear a hole in a rock. Given enough time, it'll just wear a hole in a rock. And that was prophesied in Daniel chapter 7. So let's go to, we're just going to read verse 25. Daniel 7, verse 25. Talking about one of the kings of the resurrected Roman Empire. Daniel 7, verse 25, this king of the Roman, uh, resurrected Roman Empire says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High. The Most High is God Almighty. And notice this, not, not only speaking against the Most High, but shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Now, the, the uh, Hebrew word for uh, wear out is Strong's, uh, Strong's definition is this. It is used only in a mental sense. Not a physical sense. It is used in a mental sense. The Aramaic translation of the Old Testament says this, quote, wear out emotionally and mentally. The complete Jewish Bible says, exhaust the holy ones. So this is not a physical exhaustion like from overwork. It's, it's a mental and uh, an emotional exhaustion. And Satan is very good at that. And I think if, if you've been in the church more than a few years, we all know what Satan can do to exhaust us mentally 
or emotionally. Now, that's why Christ says in Matthew 24 that he who endures to the end shall be saved. Noah certainly did that. A hundred years, very close to a hundred years, under pressure that each one of us individually has yet to experience. But we need to follow his example. We need to follow in that example and not let the society around us cause us to get off track, to become tired, to become disillusioned, and to be worn out. Now we come to the fourth and the last lesson we can learn. And uh, this, this is the biggest one. Noah learned that Yehovah does the saving if we will trust in him. Noah learned that Yehovah does the saving if we trust in him. We don't save ourselves. Noah built a boat that could not save him. If, 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 if normal uh, tsunamis and normal hurricanes can destroy a boat built out of metal, no matter how perfect that boat might be by, by standards today, compared to the, to the wave action and the storms that uh, Noah faced, uh, no boat built by man could uh, survive that. I don't care how perfect the boat is. No humanly built boat then in Noah's day or now could survive the waves caused by the, the deep breaking open and the tsunamis and then the winds. There's no boat uh, built by human hands that could survive that. It took Yehovah's divine intervention to save Noah. Yehovah had to be with Noah every minute, every second of every day in order for Noah and his family to survive. Now, that holds true for us in spades. Let's go to Ephesians 2, and we're going to read verses 8 and 9. We do not save ourselves. There's only one source of salvation. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. Very fundamental scripture. For by grace are you saved through faith. Now, if anything we've seen in the account of Noah is that he had faith to follow Yehovah in building the boat, following the instructions to build the boat, and enduring for roughly a hundred years in building that boat. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, neither grace nor faith of yourselves. It is the gift of God both the grace and the faith, not of works, lest any man should, bo should uh, boast. As with Noah, you see, our salvation is a gift from our Father. It's not a function of any boat we can build, physically or spiritually. It's not through our own works. And in fact, uh, God Almighty calls our works filthy rags in Isaiah chapter 64. We can't, we can't have enough good works to impress God Almighty that he will bow before us and say, oh, you deserve this. And, I, and, and uh, I'm going to give this to you because you deserve it. You worked hard for it. That's not the way it works. It is a gift. As with Noah, you see, we can't save ourselves. Salvation comes from our Father and from His Son. Let's go to Revelation 7, and we're going to read verses 9 and 10. Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10. I'm going to read this one out of the New uh, International Version. Revelation 7, uh, Verse 9 will be out of the New International Version, and then verse 10 out of the New Living Translation. Revelation 7, verse 9, the NIV. 
After this, I looked, and there was before me a great multitude that no one can count, from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. That's Revelation 7, verse 9 out of the NIV. And we're going to read verse 10 out of the New Living Translation. And they were shouting with a mighty shout, Salvation comes from our God on the throne and from the Lamb. Only two sources of salvation, the Father and His only begotten Son. The source is the throne of God Almighty. Satan has nothing to do with it. Our works have nothing to do with it. Our intentions have nothing to do with it. It's, it is a gift from our Heavenly Father. And as the Father saved Noah, He will save us, but there's always usually a, a big if in there somewhere. The Father saved Noah, and He will save us if we trust in Him. It is simple as that. Noah trusted after he was given the, the knowledge that I'm going to destroy all mankind except you and your family, and uh, I want you to build this boat uh, to carry you above the waters of the flood. Noah trusted Him for a hundred years. Good days, bad days, clear skies, rainy skies. Scoffers, those who condemned him, didn't make any difference. <clears throat> I don't know if you, you thought about this, but <clears throat> if you read the account of the ark and all the details about the ark, <clears throat> you know, the ark is the only boat I know of that was built without a rudder, when you think about it. There are no instructions that the ark have a rudder. With all the details about the ark, even the fact that you put asphalt on the inside and the outside, uh, there's no mention of a rudder. Now, a rudder is a, is a flat pla plate uh, hinged vertically, mounted at the stern or, or the rear of the boat, and the rudder turns right and left, and it will steer the boat. And uh, on, on boats, certainly the larger boats, uh, the captain of the boat and his assistants have a big wheel, and that's why it's called a wheelhouse. That's where this big wheel is, and you've seen it, where they turn the wheel, and it's linked by linkage to the rudder, and you can make it go left or right. But Yehovah didn't command a rudder to be included on this ark. He did not do that. And why? Because no human is going to save that boat. I don't care how skilled uh, a captain Noah might be, and he obviously, that was not his job, for what we're told, uh, but no matter how skilled a human might be, and no matter how well the boat was built, it was not going to survive uh, that flood. Those waves, those winds, the breaking up of the deep, the tearing of the, the earth's crust, it wasn't going to survive. And uh, the only way it would survive was the fact that Yehovah was in command of the boat. And Yehovah doesn't need a rudder. And he, he uh, orders the waves and orders the wind and orders the direction of the boat in the waves according to to his plan, and he will save the boat. He will supernaturally save the boat, and that's something we need to always keep in mind. You see, Noah knew who was piloting the ark and who was guiding it and protecting it, thereby saving all on board. And without a rudder, you, you can imagine when he was given the instructions of building the ark, I mean, even if he wasn't a, uh, a, sail, a, a, a sailor, he, we all know about a rudder, and he, he'd kind of wonder, oh, well, aren't you leaving something out here, uh, God? You know, how are we going to direct this boat to save our lives? 
And so without a rudder, he dramatically knew uh, who was in charge. Without a rudder, he dramatically knew who was going to steer that boat. And it wasn't him. It wasn't him at all. And he knew that our father would be steering that boat. And the fact is that uh, the father was doing the saving. And so the lesson for us, you see, is that we have to totally understand and totally submit to the fact that the Father is steering our boat. We don't steer it. We follow. We follow in the example of Jesus Christ. We follow the commands of God Almighty. And we are to follow in those footsteps, you see. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Father and His Son steer our boat. Noah learned that from the, on a physical level. We need to learn that on a spiritual level. Okay, let's conclude now. Um, not only is, is, is the story of Noah and the ark uh, set apart in Genesis, uh, but it was also set apart by Jesus. It was also set apart by Peter. It was also set apart by Paul. And, uh, and if the father and his son and the apostles highlighted the days of Noah, and Genesis spends as much time as it does, relatively speaking, compared to the previous 1,650-odd years in human history, then clearly there are things our father wants us to learn from this account of Noah. And one, obviously, should be that we should remember this account, we should study this account, and we should learn from this account. And today we've, we've examined four lessons that Yehovah gives us a part to play in our own salvation, that Noah was motivated, motivated by what he could not see as, to, as opposed to what he could see, Noah did not let society discourage him and cause him to quit or have a bad attitude or turn against his father. And the fourth is Noah learned that Yehovah does the saving. So in addition to all of this, let's remember the flood as an example of our father's love for us, love for Noah and his family. And ultimately, love for all that died in the flood because they will have their chance. Let's go to Genesis chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 11 through 15 in closing. Genesis 9, verse 11 through 15. <clears throat> Genesis 9, verse 11. Yehovah is speaking to Moses, I, I mean to uh, Noah, I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of a flood. Neither shall any more be a flood to destroy the earth. What a promise. Verse 12, and God said, this is the token of the covenant which I've made between me and you and every living creature that is with you which is us today, for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. Verse 15, I and I will remember my covenant, that's a promise, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Our Father, at the end of the day, shows His love toward all of us by promising not to have another flood. But instead, what he promises, if we look at the entirety of Scripture, is that he and his son will return 
when conditions get as bad as they were in the days of Noah. And not only is he with Noah and us, he promises not to have another physical flood, but we have even greater promises that he and his son will come and rule this earth and we will be there as spirit beings to help him rule this earth. Much greater promises, much greater outcome, and it's eternal and not just physical. So let's all learn from the life of Noah.